in chapter 3, as we continue on our study with the seven churches here, looking this morning at the church of Sardis. Starting in chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, and thou hast the name that thou livest, and are dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, may we see this morning as we read your word, Lord, the warnings that are put before us from you, not only unto the church of Sardis, but unto the churches until the end. Lord, may we ever be careful and cautious that we may be so caught up in who we are, in what church we go to, in what events we are involved in, in what events we manage, or how beautiful our voices that we get so caught up that we, to the world, have a name that looks alive, but we're dead. What a fearful thought, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us this morning. We know that the house of God is the most exciting place to be in the world when you are here. And when you're not here, Lord, we know it is the most dreadful place to be. Lord, I pray that you pour your spirit upon us this morning. Lord, if there be someone under the sound of my voice, Lord, who is lost, may today they see what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins. Lord, we pray that you do a mighty work, Lord. Revive us. Revive me, Lord. Search my heart, Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, let me be a better servant for you. And this is the cry that we put for upon all those who are laboring here in this church, in this building today. We give thanks to you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. It is said that the speed of light travels about 186 thousand miles per second. Yet astronomers tell us that the light from the polar stars takes about 33 years to reach Earth. The star literally could have plunged into darkness some 30 years ago and its light would still be pouring down upon the Earth. The star could literally be shining in the sky tonight as brightly as it ever has, as if nothing could ever happen. And as we look up, we see the light with our own eyes as it's taken some 30 years to travel here. Yet in reality, the star could actually be dead. The light from the star is shining with its brilliance of times past. The church at Sardis was somewhat like that. It had a name that was living. It had a name that they were alive, that they were a part of the local New Testament church, that they burned for God. They had the light in a dark place, 
But somewhere along the way, while they continued to shine the light forth, imagine it like this. They continued with their programs. They continued with their worship hour. Every Sunday, the lot was full of people. Every Wednesday, the lot was full of people. Everyone arrived for Tuesday visitation. They had a name that they were once alive. They continued to shine in that manner. But somewhere along the way, the reason that they had done those things had died. They had a name that was alive, but they had very much become dead. It's a trembling thought that I could arrive here week after week and preach the word of God. And yet, in my heart, be dead. That the reason that... I ever surrendered in the ministry, the reason I was ever called into ministry, that I could get so many years down the road and forget about the one who called me in the ministry. That we could arrive here and sing as a church and lift our voices up in the most beautiful way and yet be a dead church. That we could have vacation Bible school that we could be so appealing to the world that we could instill entice people to come in, invite them to enjoy and to invite them to join our dead church. That the reality is that the church could actually become a morgue of people. Yes, we're here. Yes, we're in the flesh. Yes, we give, but the church was dead. It does not matter what others say about our church. It doesn't matter if others promote the Witten Place Baptist Church and say that we are a church that burns with a bright light. The reality is it could be a bright light from a brilliant past, not a burning presence. Sardis is the fifth church that we'll look at as we continue the Lord's letters unto the seven churches as we continue to complete this postal route. Last week we looked at the church of Thyatira. The church here at Sardis was just 30 miles southeast of the church of Thyatira. It was a heavily fortified city. It was a city many believed that was impenetrable. They didn't think it could be conquered. Their arrogance ran throughout the land that no one could defeat them. On one side of, the, of this great city with these massive walls, there was a steep cliff that ran down the backside of it. There's something different about this church in Sardis that's uh, different than what we've seen at Pergamos and different than what we've seen at Thyatira. They seem to have thwarted, they seem to have been able to defeat the oppression that we were seeing from the outside world by navigating through issues that they faced. Meaning that when we seen in Pergamos, when we seen in Thyatira that persecution was setting out against them, instead of facing the persecution in faith, they instead involved themselves in the practices that God had delivered them out of. They went back to idolatry. They went back to temple worship. They went back to involving themselves in immoralities. They did all of these to ease the pressure that was coming down upon them. But here with the church at Sardis, they seem to do something just a tad bit different. Instead of involving themselves in all of the immoralities, instead of involving themselves in all of the pagan things that were going on in the culture of the day. The church at Sardis began to see the onset of persecution and said, we've got to devise a, another way, another plan. So what the church at Sardis agreed to do is to remove the exclusivity of the gospel. They said, not only is our way right, but your way is right too. Not only is Judaism right, but so is our way. Not only is emperor worship right, but so is our way. They had, under the pressure, melted and conformed to the culture. They became a polytheistic church. Remember what Christ has done when he came into the world, right? This thing that the church at Sardis did, they literally killed the gospel message. 
Christ came into the world to save sinners. He did not come into the world to accompany other religious systems. He didn't come into the world to collaborate with other religious systems. He came into the world for one thing alone, and that was to rescue the uh, people, the humanity, out of the religious systems of the day. Let us all be reminded that to compromise the distinctiveness, to compromise the exclusivity of, of Christ, is to compromise the message in which Christ died for. It is to compromise the whole reason that God sent his son to allow someone to say that there are many ways to heaven, that there are many ways to God, to hold dearly to your message and yet allow someone else to have a past to say that they believe that their way is the way is to totally disregard and to compromise the exclusivity of the message of Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 46. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The people of Sardis was pressing the believers because the gospel they preached condemned their religion. And instead of standing in boldness and preaching this exclusive message, and telling them what Proverbs 14, 12, there is a, a way that seemeth right unto a man, but in the end of, thereof are the ways of death. Instead of telling them, you think that is right, but this is what Christ said. Instead of making this bold stand and proclaiming this, they said, you know what? You're right too. We're all right. And when you grant that kind of pass to mankind, that there's another pass to heaven, we condemn the gospel of Jesus Christ. A little more about this city, Sardis. In 17 AD, an earthquake destroyed this city. It was rebuilt by the Emperor Augustus, and since it was rebuilt by the Emperor Augustus, they went ahead and erected a temple unto him there for worship. Twice in history, though, these people believed that this was an impenetrable fortress. Twice in history, Sardis was conquered. When this place was excavated, when they excavated it, you could just see how much of the get-along mentality had really spread throughout the entire culture. Where we had previously seen, if you pronounce that there's only one way to heaven, you would have been cast out of the city. You would have been persecuted. You would have been prohibited from being a part of the trades. You wouldn't have been able to buy and sell and get gain. And this is what we've seen in the previous thing. But because of what Sardis had done, when they did the excavation, it really unfolded right before our eyes. Here in Sardis, there was such a plurality of religions and faith that in the place of commerce, when they excavated it, there was a place, a booth where Christians sold. There was a booth right next to it for Judaism. There was a booth right next to it for Artemis. There was a booth right next to it for the emperor. They were all together selling and getting gain. If you can think back in your mind about how, how, much emphasis and how much instruction God gave to the construction of the tabernacle. And we think about how specific and how careful the Jews were about using names and how, how careful they were about their names in the construction and even how they handled things in the synagogue. If we will think back on that, we will even be further enlightened about how much they were just saturated and how much these religions had just melted together. When we think about Daniel, when Daniel and uh, Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah were captured and taken back to Babylon, when they were taken back to Babylon, one of the first things that King Nebuchadnezzar did was give them a different name. He gave them a different name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Joseph had his name changed. What was this all about? They were attempting to take these Christians, these followers of Christ, these people of Israel, and they were attempting to bring them to their culture. That is kind of what happens today, right? This is what we see even in movies today and in television today. The world is attempting to educate and bring our children into their culture. When they excavated the synagogue here, 
one of the first things that I read that shocked me was that on the pillars of the synagogues, they had all the names of the members who came to this synagogue, but instead of their names be, being written in the original Hebrew, they were written in Greek. One of the second things that shocked me is there here when you go into the temple is that when you seen the altar inside of the synagogue, when you came upon the altar, the altar was held up by two entirely huge Roman eagles. Throughout the entire synagogue was all of the animals of the Greek culture. This is how much the Greek culture had not only permeated the faith of Judaism, but this is how much pressure and this is how much permeation even happened in the church at Sardis. They were completely saturated. But as we know what the word of God says, that when the Lord says here to the church at Sardis, unto the church at Sardis, these things saith he that have the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. It is that Sardis has been put on the scale. It is that Sardis has been weighed in the balances. It is that Sardis is saying, the, the Lord is saying unto Sardis, I have weighed you, and this is how this is all unfolded to you. No action by man has ever slipped by God. No behavior in the house of God has ever slipped by God. No failure to follow after God has slipped by God. When Jonah was in the belly of the ship, the consequences of Jonah's decision to not follow after God fell upon Jonah when the storm came. When Adam sinned in the garden, God knew where Adam was, and the consequences of Adam's bad decision fell not only upon Adam, but it fell upon all men. When God was speaking to Job, and he was communicating with Job. What did God make clear? God made clear to Job that he was ignorant of God's ways. And I think that's where we are today. We think that we have slipped by. We think that maybe God has not seen exactly what we have going on in our personal life. I think sometimes when we read unto the church of Sardis, we begin to think unto the building. Reminder, reminder, unto the people inside the building. You have a name that you're living, but you are dead. God still today, he overrules and he still places every church, every member in the scale and balances them out. We have been placed in the divine scale. God has weighed man. God has weighed his churches. This is number five of the seven churches. And the Lord has faithfully weighed them again. Here we find the frightening news that they had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. They had events planned, but they were dead. They had people inside of the house of God, but they were dead. They had money in the bank, but they were dead. They had a pastor in the church who preached the word of God, but they were dead. They were once alive, but now they're dead. Maybe this is the most frightening portion that they have grown so cold with the Lord that they didn't even realize that they were now dead. They didn't even realize that what, what they once had was now missing. They would say the church is booming. Look at them. They're doing great. Look at all the events they have. Look at all the people in there. But the Lord would say, yes, but they are dead. Well, they're friendly, yes, but they are dead. Hear me, they had a name that they were believers, but there was no new life in them. I don't know where everyone is today, and I'm actually thankful that I don't. It's troubling at times to know just where I am with the Lord. But the reality is, is that with the church of Sardis is, is the trouble. Of, I say that the church of Sardis is probably more familiar to each and every one of us as believers than others because there are times where it seems that we all grow cold. That the passion that we used to have when we came to the house of God is cold. The desire that we once had to hear God's word is cold. Now, I, I can't tell you this. 
but the desire, the passion, the zeal that we once had to come to the house of God, I pray that we all still have it, but if we don't, it's because we're cold. The things that occupy our time during the services that used to never interrupt us, now they interrupt us. It's because we're cold. There's a little girl in this community who cracks me up. She stops by my house often, and when she stops by my house, one of the things that she likes to do is to boss my son Levi around. Uh, the other day she stopped by, and I could hear her outside telling my son Levi to do this and to do that, and as I looked out the window, my son Levi was sitting out there ignoring her as he continued to play with his toys. Well, this little girl kind of got hip to the situation that the gig was up, that Levi wasn't listening no more. So she said to him, your dad told me to tell you to do this. Levi quickly jumped up and ran into the house and said, dad, did you tell her to tell me to do this? I said, man, this girl's got it going on. See, what the girl did is she realized that he was no longer listening to her, so she applied some authority to her words to get Levi to do exactly what she wanted him to do by invoking the name of his father. I am afraid what has happened in the house of God week after week is that we arrive here at times and we hear the word of God being lifted up and we no longer take it as the word of God. We take it as the word of man. We invoke the name of the heavenly father when we read these words where he challenges not only the church at Sardis, but he challenges us to wake up. Wake up. Can you not see that you've gone cold? This is what the challenge is to the church at Sardis. Can you not see it? Can you not see where you are? Can you not see it in the whole time when we hear the word of God lifted up? Even though we know and we've been told that this is the word of the Lord, this is the word of our heavenly father, it has no impact upon us at all. We continue to sit there as if the name of the father was never invoked upon us. Our hearts do not long for the word. It's a war just to stay awake. It's a war just to pay attention. We shrug off the truths. We shrug off his commandments. One of the first things that happens is when you're sick and you go to the doctors, of course, they don't ask me, but for the skinny folks, they ask this. But the first thing you go, happens when you go to the doctors, they ask you, how's your appetite? The reason they ask you for your appetite is because they understand that if your appetite has dwindled, it's further worse than they actually thought. I ask us all this morning, how's your appetite this morning? If your appetite this morning wasn't to arrive here in the house of God to learn the word of the Lord, if when the word of the Lord was read aloud and lifted up, it wasn't the most important thing that's going on in our lives, it brings us to the reality that our appetite has dwindled away. And if our appetite then has dwindled away, then maybe we should just take the most simple diagnosis from the world and say, from the doctors of this life and say, something is clearly wrong when you're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness. There are probably more churches like Sardis than we care to admit who have no hunger for the word, who have no desire for the word. It doesn't bother us to be away from the word. It doesn't bother us to be away from truth. It doesn't bother us to be away from the church. There is only two diagnoses, but they both end the same. You are either dying or you're dead. No matter what anyone else says, no matter what anyone else praises you about, no matter any of those things that people say, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. The Lord says, I know your works. 
I know your name. I know the truth. Notice what he says in verse 2 and 3. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. They are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, that thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. When I read verse 2, all I can see is the Lord standing there in the doors of the emergency room as the patient is ushered in. This word here saying, <clears throat> be watchful, it is to wake up. Wake up. That is this literal definition. Wake up when he tells them the urgency of the matter. Wake up. Be watchful. It is time to be alert. Can't you see where you are? Don't you see how cold you become? The Lord is the doctor in the emergency room telling the patient, it is time to wake up. Hang with me here. It is time to acknowledge the seriousness of the condition. It is time to be restored. It is time to be brought to a place of alertness. The Lord tells them, while many of, you, many of them are dead, there are still a few of you who are still alive. Wake up and see what's happening. You're, you're changing. You're changing. I wonder, the church at Sardis, did it not trouble them? Did it, did it not cause them fear that they had gone so long without he feeling the spirit move? I wonder if it troubled the church at Sardis, the people of Sardis, that they had found themselves in a place in their own life where they didn't even want to read the word. Even worse, did it trouble the people at Sardis that they had gotten so cold that they didn't even care that it was the Lord's word? They had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. Does it trouble us today? When is the last time that you felt the Holy Ghost move inside of you? I don't know how we've ever developed a theory and a thought process that the Holy Ghost is an active agent 5,000 miles away. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. When is the last time that we communed with the Lord and we felt the Holy Spirit burn inside of us? When is the last time that we, we, we have burned for the word, that we've burned for the Lord, that we've had desires, that we, we wanted to not only be known for being alive, that the most important thing to us was our relationship with Christ. The Lord's urging, urging to the church of Sardis was, wake up. You have not only grown cold with me, but you have lost your fight. You've lost your heart. You're becoming blind. You are now something that you were, you, you were not once were. Something in this world has you. It has your attention. When is the last time this condition of this world has brought you to your knees? Wake up. Wake up. As he says, Paul says in Romans, awake thou that sleepest. Now is the time to strengthen the things that remain. And that which remain, he says, is also ready to die. Meaning that there is also, there's some few things that remain that need to be strengthened. But if they are not strengthened, the things that do remain are on their way out the door too. It is troubling the complacency, the Laodicean age, the Sardis, the coldness of Sardis that we see today even in the local New Testament churches. I talked to a brother in Florida. I talked to a brother in New York and even here where the, the attendance on Wednesday nights is so small and so tiny that they just shut down the services. Another brother moved down in Florida on Sunday nights to completely do away with the Sunday evening services altogether. Is it the church? Is it the singing? What is it? It is that people have gone cold. 
They have grown cold with the Lord. They have no desire to be in the house of God. They have totally forsaken Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, forsaking not the assembly of ourselves. We have forsaken the fact that God has instituted a church. You just read Sardis and brings to your mind what Paul said to the church at Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? That, that which had begun in the spirit will now what? Be made perfect in the flesh? That the reason that you have even arrived in this building is because God has done a mighty work in your life. And now that he's done this mighty work in your life, you have arrived and he brought you to a place that you could have never got to on your own. And now you think that you can make it without him? You don't ration yourself at the dinner table, but you ration yourself when it comes to the things of God. Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, foolish churches. Oh, foolish people today. We are cold. We have left our source of strength. We think we are good. We sing songs like marching to Zion. We are exhausted. We smile to each other. We say, amen, hallelujah. We're exhausted. We're, we're still pushing on for the Lord. We say, amen. We're pushing we're, we're to the point where we're winded in service for the Lord. But we have left the reality that the reason that we are so exhausted in service for the Lord isn't because we're doing wrong in service for the Lord. It's because we have left the source of our strength. We have found ourselves away from the Lord. You see the world, to the world they were a shining light, but to the Lord all of their motions and all of their actions were pointless. Most of us can remember Judges, and Judges, I love the book of Judges, but in Judges chapter 16, when we read the story of Samson, Samson had the same problem as the church of Sardis. Despite all of Samson's amazing victories, I mean, think about all the amazing stories we tell our children about the things that God did through Samson to help the children of Israel. He slew a thousand with a donkey of a jawbone. He carried the gates of the city out into the desert. And we read about all these amazing acts and we are saying, wow, God mightily used Samson. Look at the strength that Samson had. Every time we read it, we already know how the story is going to unfold in excitement. When we see the obstacle, and then the next sentence says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. And we know that God is about to mightily use Samson to do something. And then guess what happened? Delilah came on the scene. When Delilah came on the scene, she agonized and begged daily, the Bible says, trying to find the source of Samson's strength. Samson should have never been with Delilah. It was the Nazarite vow, but Samson was drew in by sin. All of his amazing victories, all the days that God used him mightily as a leader, all the days that God used him as a judge, and she urged him for the source of his strength. And one day she found out and she cut his hair. It was not the haircut that caused Samson to lose his strength, but it was the disobedience to God. Then came the saddest, tragic moment in the entire book of Judges, if you ask my personal opinion. When the Philistines arrived outside of Delilah's home to capture Samson, Samson, they said, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon us. And Samson jumped up and ran out, and he wist not that the Spirit of the Lord was not upon him. Samson arrived and went out to battle and failed to even realize that the Lord was no longer in his life, that his sin had separated him from his strength. He was captured. His eyes were put out. 1620 offers us some tragic insight of what happened in his life. He knew not that the Lord had departed from him. This was the same man that God had mightily used. This was the same man that God had mightily used to bring victories. Now Samson was imprisoned. He was blind. 
He was humiliated. He was facing death. I wonder how many days Samson sat there and as he had to turn grain for the enemy. And I wonder how many days he wondered, how in the world did I ever get here? I wonder how the remnant at Sardis felt when they received this letter from the Lord. You had a name that was living, but now you are dead. I wonder if they wondered, how did we ever get here? We were so bright. Samson was so powerful. But yet, the compromise brought this in their life. And when sin entered in, it destroyed their strength. How did we ever get where we are today where no one even seems to care for the house of God? How is it that we justify in our minds that we used to be so faithful to the house of God. We used to be so faithful to the things of God. We used to see people who were sold out for the things of God. And now, it, now it is everything we can do just to get to a service every couple weeks. Where is the faithfulness? Where is the burning? Where is the light? I can call you every week. A church member can call you every week to remind you that we have service on Sunday. But do I need to? Does the church really realize this? It is not no person's job in the church. Now we are to bear ye one another's burdens. We are to encourage one another. We should do all of these things. But I cannot carry your spiritual life, nor can you carry mine. If you can't see the good things of the Lord in your life now, then I cannot put them in there either. Sin had Samson bound. Sin had Samson blinded. But toward the end of the story... I love this. How be it in verse 22 of Judges, the Bible says the greatest part of Samson's life wasn't the first half. It was the back half. How be it the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. The enemy had to begin to believe that he was completely done. The enemy had begun to believe that he was blind. He was powerless. He had defied his one true God, and they were in for quite the surprise. They believed it was all over for the mighty man of God, but God allowed his hair to grow again. God allowed for his strength to return again. God allowed for Samson to bring a mighty victory again. Samson had to come to an end of himself first. And remember, this tragedy only happened because the world got in between his relationship with the Lord. So this bright and beautiful church that once used to brightly burn for the Lord, the Bible tells them, and the Lord tells them in verse 3, I say all that to bring this into perspective, especially because of how Sardis ends. The Lord tells them in verse 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Our own memory of where we used to be with the Lord, our own memory of how we used to burn for the Lord can do more conviction in a man's heart than a thousand sermons preached. Just the memory of reminding ourselves and looking back on where we once were with the Lord. Remember Remember, remember that even this church here, the Witten Place Baptist Church, is only here. The only reason that this church is here is because someone once had a, a burden. Someone once got support from other churches to try to plant a church here. Someone once prayed, if it's God's will for us to plant a church here, then let his will be done. And the only way that this church will continue to survive and thrive is if the church members today will continue to carry on the same burden. The only way we will continue to live is if its members remain it remains in their hearts the burdens to see this ministry go forward. If therefore thou shalt not watch. This is the Lord's return. If, if therefore thou shalt not watch. Meaning if you're not going to heed my words. If you're not going to wake up. If you're not going to be vigilant. 
I will come as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, for us, this may not make much sense. But as I said in the beginning, Sardis believed they were completely impenetrable. They believed they were unable to be conquered. They believed that there was no one that could overthrow them. Yet as I said in the beginning, that they were overthrown. They knew exactly what it meant when the Lord said, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon me, on thee. This city here, they were conquered, and their conquering that happened upon them happened in the night. It was said that King Croesus, he was the one that originally had this wall built to protect the people. But one time, Darius the Great had set up outside this Persian Empire, set up outside to conquer Sardis. Sardis laughed it away. They were confident. They were arrogant. And for many days, the Persian army camped outside of Sardis, and Sardis was completely unfazed. Until one day it says that one of the guards for the wall looked over the side of the wall, and his helmet fell off his head and hit the ground. The soldier, realizing that he needed his helmet, walked down a set of secret stairways and opened a door at the bottom of the wall and retrieved his helmet and went back to guard. That night, members of the Persian army slipped in the secret door. And while everyone went to sleep at night in complete arrogance and complete confidence, they were completely oblivious that in their bed, they were overthrown as a thief in the night. They thought they were safe. They thought they were secure. But they were completely overthrown. Verse 4 says, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. We have a rule when we get home from church. My wife usually opens the garage door so that my oldest son can let his behemoth of a dog out. But she always tells me, do not cut through the basement. The reason she doesn't like me cut, to cut through the basement is because I'm clumsy. And about nine times out of ten, if I cut through the basement, I end up bumping into my workbench that happens to be covered in grease. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I cut through the basement, and the grease did not come out. And I put it right across my white pants. My garment was defiled. The Lord said unto the church of Sardis, there are a few of you left who have remained in Sardis and have not bumped up against the filth of Sardis and you don't have it upon you. While some of you have removed the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are still a few of you who have refused to be defiled. You have refused to have that filth on you. You have held fast to the truth of God's word. You have held fast to my word. You have a few who have managed to remain clean. They are worthy. That's what the Lord says. In Sardis, in this age where everybody seemed to just be melting together, there was a few who were worthy still. There were a few who remained faithful. He says here, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Man, you cannot imagine the amount of people who say, See, there it is. There it is. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. They say, see, see, you can have your name taken out of the book of life. That's exactly what the Lord says. How dreadful and terrorizing it is when people take a verse that is a verse of promise and turn it into a verse of terror. It is to the true Christian, what the Lord is saying to the one who remains faithful, to my son, to my children in the faith, I will not blot your name out of 
my books. You will not be removed. Understand the promise. It doesn't make much sense to us, but in their time, it made complete sense. In each of these cities, it was a registry, a book of the living. In the book of the living, when you died, guess what happened? You were struck from the book of the living. When you committed a crime that would deserve a, a high offense, you was thrown out of the city, and guess what? You no longer lived in that city, so your name was struck from the book of the living. But the Lord tells them, listen, remain faithful. What is this? To you who are worthy, I will not take you out of the book of life. What does this mean? That means that though you may face persecution, because you did not compromise, you, you did not remove the exclusivity of the gospel. Because you remain faithful, even if you die, you will not be taken from the book of life. You will not be removed from the book in heaven. You have a place in eternity with me. He's the Bible, as we said even before, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because of our faith, we do not have to worry about eternal damnation. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So what happened in Sardis? We have a unique piece to the puzzle. History is offered up to us here. In Sardis, we are able to read because of church history that there's a man by the name of Melito who six decades after the church received this letter, Melito was known to be a faithful pastor in Sardis. He was known to uphold the truth of God's word in Sardis. So what does this mean for us? Well, I guess the reasonable conclusion for me is that these people in Sardis heard the word of the Lord. They seen that there was only some things left, and that which they had left remaining, they strengthened it. They heeded the word of the Lord. They followed after it. Remember, we've seen this time after time with the churches we've seen so far, even when we've seen in the last week, that he suffers that woman Jezebel. He said, I gave you space to repent. God's desire is not judgment. It is repentance. It is relationship. It is to be unified with his children. And we see here with Sardis that the judgment was falling upon them, but they heeded the word of the Lord. And six decades later, there was a man in Melito, named Melito in Sardis preaching the truths of God's word who withstood and stood up against many of that day. That's the power of the word of the Lord. This is what's upon even all of us today. I wish we... At times, Christians did not lack sincerity to the truths of God's word. I wish at times we didn't lack desire to the truths of God's word. I do not know what it will take for Christians just to wake up and see where they are. I don't know what it's going to take for people to to come to church, not just 4,600 North Edgewood. I've been other places. I've talked to other pastors. What is it going to take for believers to see their desperate need for the Lord? The Lord brings all of this upon the church of Sardis for where they are in one word. He says, Remember, remember where you once was with the Lord and remember where you are now. Remember the passion that you once had for the Lord and remember the passion you have now. Remember the zeal that you once had in service for the Lord and remember now. Remember the days when you used to, you just could not get enough of God's word. God's word is still that good. But see where you are now. There is nothing more bless, a blessing to remember. You know, I love thinking back and remembering about my father who's gone. But to remember where I have come up short, to remember where I am now versus where I once was, that is a very troubling 
matter at times. David seen it. He said, what did he say? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Restoration. I need it. Help, Lord. The church, the call to the church of Sardis is remember, repent, restore. The call to the church today for each and every believer at 4600 North Edge, we're just across this nation, is, you know, maybe you're exactly where you're supposed to be. But if you're not, remember, repent, and restore. That's the call for all of us, that we will live a life more devoted to Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that you'll be with us this morning, Lord. Challenge our hearts, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. Awaken us, Lord. It's the woes of this life, Lord, are weighing down upon your children. Lord, I pray that you restore excitement in our hearts again. Restore excitement to be here in your word, Lord. I'm certain that some may even leave here today and not even.